Hey, I'm glad to see so many people here, so hopefully it makes you interested in what I'm going to talk about. And I'll just sleep in the back of the room. Um, I've talked with a couple of people at the beginning of this week about the talk I'm going to, I'm going to make. And uh, many of them actually wanted me to talk to and to present many different, different topics. So that easily take up to more than two hours, so I have to disappoint at least a couple of you. And I won't be able to go into detail as much as I would like to on all the topics, but hopefully I'll find it interesting. And I'll also try, or I invite you next year to whatever country to look at for a lot of I'd like to start with a quick disclaimer. There are personal opinions in that I want to present a talk that more or less on the, on the same topic uh, in August at the Linux Members Conference. And I thought it would be pretty controversial because there were a couple of opinions that I was totally convinced about uh, that I really thought people in the community wouldn't agree with. And it turned out that actually that it happened and most of the people in the room agreed. Uh, I haven't received any uh, play mail afterwards, nobody threatened me to that, so I guess that's a good sign. Uh, but anyway, there are a couple of personal that I've inside, and uh, I really encourage you to uh, either ask me questions at the end of the talk, uh, you can disagree with me, and you can even, if you like, interrupt me in, in the talk and, and raise questions or whatever you want. So, this being said, I'm going to start with defining the problems in hand here, uh, giving you a bit of a view just to, uh, to really explain what, uh, what we need to do on the graphics display here, so we need to understand what the problem is. I'll briefly go through uh, the history of the different uh, subsystems we have in the kernel that are related to the display, uh, where it came from, and compare the respective <coughs> features to see what they can actually do. And I'll then go to the <coughs> to the main topic of this talk, which is to uh, to guide you to actually select an API and find out what you should do both on the kernel side and on the user space side when you want to be able to display. So to get started, the problem is from a really high level, really easy to explain. You get a display that's totally off. Anyone to display something. That's the 10,000 feet, feet uh, point of view. That looks pretty simple, said left that way, but there's actually quite a lot underneath. So the first problem we have to tackle is that, well, what do you want to do with the screen? Uh, display is definitely important. So I'll give a couple of definitions here because uh, we need to, to make sure that we we'll talk about uh, what is the same things. Display means, at least for this presentation, everything you need to do to actually control, control your display hardware. So that means like enabling the display, uh, making sure that the video stream can be output, like configuring the mode, the resolution, uh, exposing all that information to user space. It's more the control side. Uh, setting a resolution of the monitor is definitely something that, that you need to do. It's not really an easy task, but that doesn't give you any, any output on the screen. So display is on the control side, and then you want to actually output something on the screen. And then you actually have two major use cases for that, um, at least uh, as far as I'm concerned for this stuff. And those use cases are either graphics, so you want to display to output frame that you prepare, that you paint, that you, you, want to, you want to out of stream, and that you usually want to keep for a certain amount of time. Uh, and on the other side is also video. And video is quite different because in that case, you change, you change the frame that is being displayed, that's being out to the screen at, well, every frame. Uh, and you usually don't want to paint on that, so you don't really need to have uh, direct access to, uh, to, to, to the content on the frame and user space and you can see from the side. So those are actually two separate problems that are nowadays addressed by multi different APIs and there's some overlap. <laughs> then there's the question of the source of the display. So uh, I mentioned graphics and video, uh, they can be in different formats. That's something we need to handle. Uh, historically, most of uh, display hardware are used to display RGB and RGB data. Uh, nowadays, uh, YUV is pretty popular for video as well. We can display different formats as well. So the format is something we need to handle. Um, the data can come from memory, and it can, especially in uh, embedded systems and SOCs. 
uh, it can de be deep pipeline. So you could have like a video camera, you could have a hardware codec, a hardware H.264 decoder. And instead of writing the output to memory and then trying to display that, uh, you can actually pipeline that directly to display hardware and do SLC loads then. So there are uh, uh, two, two different use cases that we need to, uh, need to handle. Uh, and a bit related to that, the um, information that you want to have with the image uh, can come from the device, can be captured through the camera, uh, but it can also come from the CPU, you want to compose something, you want to close the screen, you want to display a window. Uh, so that's also a pretty, pretty important difference that, uh, that we need to, uh, uh, to remember. Then there's a question of what you actually want to do when you display a display frame. So feeding raw data to the, to the graphics, uh, graphics engine uh, to, to the, the display hardware. Uh, it's fine, but then you might want to scale that up or down to fit the same display. Uh, you might want to rotate that, to compose that. Um, so those operations nowadays uh, can be handled, at least some of them are usually handled by the display hardware. Uh, if you have more advanced display hardware, you can handle that and even more operations. Um, so that's also something that we need to control through users, to control through user space. And, on the, on the top of that, we obviously get, uh, users, we get user space components, uh, well, hopefully, otherwise it's pretty useless. Um, and there's quite a lot of different stacks. I've just uh, mentioned a couple of uh, possible user space components that are common in, uh, in many systems, either on the desktop side or the embedded side. Uh, there's more than that. Uh, so we need to, we need to, uh, to remember that as well and to uh, take care of uh, providing API provisions to uh, whatever we have in user space. So we'll see later that uh, actually depending on what you plan to do with the system and the use of these components that you have, uh, that will play a role in selecting the, the kind of API that, uh, that you want to provide. Speaking of APIs, there's three major ones in the kernel that can be used to uh, push video and images out of the display. So I mentioned them in no particular order. Um, DRAM is actually the most recent one that came from the GPU world uh, to, to handle 3D, uh, 3D graphics. We're going to, to go back to that. FBDEV is a uh, historical trend of interface. So I expect most of you to be at least familiar mm -hmm. yeah, with, uh, with graphics and Linux. Uh, but uh, frame buffer is just uh, a piece of memory in which you have pixel data that you feed out uh, to the display. So that's the first API we got to, uh, to handle display and it's still around uh, today, it's still, uh, it's still alive. Uh, and then we got a third API that has different use cases from here. So Video for Linux version 2, that's an API that started for video capture originally. Uh, we needed to have a little, well, it was mostly TV, uh, TV capture cards in the beginning. Uh, we had webcam support, uh, <coughs> and nowadays you, you can use video for Linux for any kind of video capture, more or less. We still have like, better, better proprietary solutions to try to get rid of that, obviously. Um, but over the, over the years, V4L also got you on for outputting video, because we had TV capture cards that could also do TV output, so it was pretty natural to have to use the same API for that. Uh, and we have capable of using the API to, uh, to handle display hardware, but mostly not in the video, but see that play. A bit more about the origins of those three APIs. So starting with the oldest one, uh, we let me there, it started in a really old version of Linux. I wasn't using Linux back then, and I expected most of you would want to either. Um, we had the first version of the uh, FBDEV API, and the timeline I'm going to show you here for the three APIs, uh, they related to the, to the kernel to user space API evolution. Um, so I'm just going to describe the major evolutions of the three APIs from, what, from the point of view of what it provides to user space. So in this case, in 1996, the first FBDEV API got to merge the kernel. Um, it took four years to have a really simple addition. Uh, it was blanking support to be able to blanket display and well, hopefully unblanket it. Uh, and then from year 2000 to 2012, well, there was still evolution inside the kernel, 
new drive is being created with no change, and at least no major change to the, to the use space API. Uh, and in 2012, we actually added support for uh, policy based formats. So for those of you who are not aware of policy that stands for four character code, that's a way to describe a video format with four, four characters. Before that, a video could only handle RGB formats. That was way too limited for the hardware we have now. So uh, we added support for uh, for CC and mostly to, uh, to be able to handle the YUV in, uh, in a couple of drives. So, between 2000, 2000 and 2012, no evolution in the API, small change in 2012, and that's it. If you go to VM and KMS, well, it's a bit more evolution in there. So, it's uh, four years later than it did uh, in the year 2000. Um, I think I was already using Linux like that back then. Um, and actually, not much in the user space API changed for the next eight years. Uh, there were changes in the driver specific APIs in DRAM, but not much in the car API. And in 2008, we, uh, we got support from JAM, which stands for Graphical Execution Manager. Uh, despite its name, it's more of a memory manager. Uh, we'll, we'll see that later as well. Um, one, one year later, we get a really important addition. Uh, that was KMS kernel mode setting. Before that, the DRAM API, like NB that would handle mode setting, had no way to set the mode for display from user from user space. So what we had is that we actually had uh, hybrid drivers, with the user space part running mostly in uh, X11, and a kernel part, and they would have to play together. So user space user space actually had uh, access to hardware directly through memory map register registers and well kernel space did the same thing obviously. Uh, so that was pretty bad. And with the addition of KMS, we decided to move all that mode setting code inside a kernel uh, and to uh, try to access to access the hardware only from the kernel drive and stop accessing that from user space. So in my opinion that's a major achievement there. We also added two points for TTM, that's a different memory manager. Memory management in DRM is a bit of a complex topic because it started from the, um, the PC side where you had different GPUs with really different uh, requirements. All of them needed to manage memory in different ways. In the beginning we just had separate memory management systems for the, the different drivers. And over the years people tried to, um, to gather all the code and try to, to create something that Drivers. We're not really there yet. TTM is one memory manager that is used by, by a couple of drivers, uh, but not all of them use it, so it's still a bit of an evolving area. We got something on this. In 2011, also really important addition with the addition of what we call dumb buffers. So before that, we look at buffers. I mean, memory is really central to, to graphics. You need to look at buffer for your frame buffer, mm -hmm. for overlays, for textures, and 3D. Uh, so buffer location was performed by driver-specific APIs. So even with a DRM driver, the drivers could expand a couple of fire controls uh, that were specific to them. Uh, so you, need, you needed to know the, which driver you were interfacing with uh, in user space to be able to, run, to use the right API. And dump buffers uh, are a single allocation API <coughs> that you can use to allocate buffers. That can be used to for frame buffers. So you can use those buffers to uh, put one image that you can then scan out to the display. Uh, allocating the buffers for the GPU for 3D, that's still something that you need to do with driver specific APIs because you have driver specific requirements in there. But at least we have a common solution that all drivers should, should support that you can use to have like early graphics at good time. In 2012, one year later, we had two bunch of planes. Uh, that was also uh, Supported through uh, driver specific APIs, uh, but now it's very standard. So you can have planes that you can overlay and compose if your hardware uh, allows that. And we get support for DMA. But I don't know how many of you have heard at least of DMA buff. Raise your hand. Okay, a couple of hands, but not too much. So, uh, in a nutshell, DMA buff is a buffer sharing framework. So instead of capturing data from one device to memory and copying that using the CPU to produce the buffer, then pushing back to another piece of hardware. We can now actually share buffers between the different pieces of hardware without the copy in there. So that's a, that's a major achievement for our performance. Last API, Video for Linux, started in uh, 1999 with the first version of Video for Linux. We 
We get a second version three years later because we realized that really the first version of the API was targeted to the hardware we had back then, mostly TV capture accounts, and it wouldn't scale for, for the, the other devices that we got then. So it was a second version. We managed to deprecate the first version of the, the API four years later uh, and remove it from the kernel. Was that last year, something like that? A couple of kernel versions ago, maybe a bit more, two years ago, maybe two years ago. Um, 2008, uh, major achievement as well in the form of VE for the sub devices. So, especially in the omitted world, uh, a video device, or any kind of digital device really, especially for video, is actually made of different pieces of hardware that you put together. Uh, like in the camera, you have an external sensor, you can have different chips on the board, and different, different IPs in your SOC. Uh, so, instead of having a single monolithic driver that would drive all that, uh, and then having to duplicate code, even if you the same chip in different boards. Uh, then we split uh, video flow drivers inside the kernel into pieces that were managed by their own driver. So we had much more reusability and we uh, were actually able to scale the, uh, easily with that. 2011, the Media Controller API, that's also a, a big step forward. Uh, that was a new API that would allow exposing the internal topology of the hardware to use space. So I'm mentioning that on the video flow slide because uh, it started as a uh, video phonics project, but it's really a media API that's media agnostic, so it can handle video, it can handle audio, it can handle whatever, whatever kind of media. Um, it doesn't even know what kind of, of media data goes through the pipeline, the, the, the hard pipelines. All it does is really expose the hardware topology to user space and allow you to route the, the, the data pipelines. Um, hopefully this year we should get the end of support for video phonics as well. That's something we're going to discuss tomorrow. Uh, there are patches that have been floating around for quite some time now. I just ended up testing them, reviewing them. The last version didn't work. So if you could get the next version, you know, it's only the same as next year. Yeah, okay. Beginning of next year. Then. Um, features now. So what we have in the different APIs that uh, that's useful for graphics and, and for video. Um, I'll briefly discuss memory management. So we get dynamic allocation of buffers in video for Linux and DRAM. So you can allocate as many buffers as you want. Well, as many buffers as the, the memory in the system allowed. Uh, we don't have that in, uh, in the frame of a API in the uh, video API. So on the video side, it's mostly static. Uh, there's also no support for importing buffers. So FBDEV can just allocate a single big uh, frame buffer inside the kernel um, and then export that to user space. You can access the frame buffer in, sorry, in the right of the frame buffer, uh, but it has no support for importing or to allocate several buffers. Uh, all the DMEs support, I mentioned multiple buffers. FBDEV doesn't really support multiple buffers. But you can all allocate a frame buffer that's larger than a screen and bam. There. So it's like having a virtual frame buffer that's much bigger on the screen, so you get this more or less the same effect as uh, multiple frame buffers that you can flip through. I uh, mentioned importing, so DRM supports DNA buff. Uh, default 2 hopefully should soon. We have a custom solution at the moment in default 2 for importing, uh, importing buffers, but that's well in many use cases when you have to pipeline. Uh, Different blocks of the SLC replaced by the buffer. On the export side, we can, ex we can end map the buffers that are allocated by the different drivers. You can end map them uh, to user space in all cases. You can also export them through the DNA buffer API for DRAM and hopefully soon for video points as well. Mode setting, so I mentioned that KMS got, uh, got added to, uh, to DRAM. Um, so we can actually uh, set modes. Uh, formats in all the three APIs. Uh, that's something that was there from the very start in FBDEV and video for Linux and get added later for DRAM. Um, you can enumerate the supported formats in video for Linux, but there's no way to enumerate that it's, uh, uh, in a good way in FBDEV, and there's no way at the moment to enumerate the formats for the main frame buffer in DRAM. <coughs> so there's no way to know what your hardware actually supports. You can do that for the planes or the overlays, but not for the main, the, the main, uh, the main frame buffer. That's something that we'll probably uh, fix in the near future. Uh, there's also no way to negotiate formats, so it's 
tell the, the, the driver, I want to I want to display something in this format digital version, and have the driver tell, tell you back, I cannot do that, but I can do this instead. So can you can you work with that? That's something we we can do in the but not the, the two other APIs. Uh, atomicity, that's a pretty important topic as well. Like you have a main main frame buffer, you have an overlay on top of that. Uh, you want to move the overlay, you can change what's in there, and you want to uh, to synchronize the page flip so that you get like no tiering uh, on, uh, on the screen. Uh, DRM has support, or will get support, a patch around to uh, to introduce atomicity in there. But that's something we cannot do at the moment with uh, FDDEV or PDLA. Last topic about the features of um, transformation. We get support for overlays in two APIs, rotation, scaling, and we can crop and pan in all three APIs. So it's mostly uh, the FDDEV API lacking support for features that were not available back then when it was introduced. Like there was no hardware that would put support. It's way too expensive in the hardware back then. Um, still the comparison of the different APIs, but from a bit different point of view. That's more or less the amount of documentation we have for the, the user space API, for the current infrastructure, and for the driver specific APIs if any, that we have in the, in the three different, uh, different frameworks. So as you can see, video following has pretty extensive documentation compared to the other two. Uh, FBDEV is pretty bad. DRM has good documentation in the current days, but that's quite recent. Uh, a couple of kernel uh, releases ago, the whole uh, current documentation for DRM was this. That was more or less everything you, you knew about how to write a DRM driver. So I thought we were lacking a bit of documentation. I had to write a DRM driver back then, so I had to go through the source code. It was a pretty painful process. So I decided to write down once I was going through and actually create some documentation for that. So nowadays we, we have something better. Regarding the code size, that's actually quite interesting as well. Uh, still split between the uh, API, the con, the different drivers. Uh, well, we can see that from the API point of view and the con point of view, the DRAM and the media Linux subsystems and APIs are much larger. So that's not really surprising because as we so in the slides before, they support more features. Um, so it's quite normal that they would get uh, pretty, pretty large code size in, uh, in there. But on the other hand, on the driver side, there's many, many more drivers for LP uh, That's also not really surprising. It's the historical uh, API we had in Linux. Um, DRM got introduced four years later, but back then that was really targeted GPUs, and there were very few GPUs, we had lots of dumb video accounts for which people wrote as video drivers. So we have like, a huge number of video drivers in mainline of uh, On the timeline now, that's the cumulative changes in the uh, in three APIs, starting from kernel 2.6.12. And yeah, video Linux and FB that started about the same the same size. Uh, in, uh, in there, uh, DRM was non existent. But as you can see, video links grew much faster than FDDEV, and DM, DRM actually uh, grew quite fast as well, especially in the beginning, uh, and it's now a bit bigger than the uh, FDDEV from the API point of view. From the call science point of view, it's uh, even more interesting. Uh, you can see the FDDEV call is pretty small, it hasn't changed much over the years. Well, the DRM car, the video for Linux car, but it's a for lots of new features and they involve quite a lot. Oops, sorry about that. So, where were we? Uh, drivers. Does it change the drivers? Um, as we saw, there's quite a lot of FBDEV drivers, so FBDEV grew steadily over the years, uh, video for Linux grew even more. They have, we have a uh, lower number of drivers, but I think that the drivers are just bigger and more complex. Uh, same for the RAM, there's uh, quite a few drivers in there compared to with VDEV, but they're, they're getting more complex, mostly because they're this one more complex hardware. And one last slide about history, and then we'll get the device model. Is uh, something that was quite interesting to see how 
slightly the different uh, subsystems where well. that's a mailing list traffic uh, all the uh, DRAM is a bit different because they have uh, the Xia that sends uh, parts to the mailing list, so it's cheating a bit. Um, so the, the line in blue is actually DRAM without <coughs> the bugs. Um, so you can see that there's less traffic on the FBDF mailing list, it's definitely less lively than the, than the others. And there's, uh, but there's a spike in here, quite recent. And that's because we have drivers nowadays that support multiple APIs, like they support DRAM, they support FBDF, they support uh, video clinics as well. Uh, and quite a few patches have been sent on all the three mailing lists to support, uh, to support the drivers. So that's why there were recent <coughs> surge in traffic in the APIs. A couple of words about a device model. That's how an FBDF device is architected. You get a frame buffer that's a piece of memory, and then you get a monolithic device that will scan that out. You can perform a couple of operations on that. You can set a mode, uh, you can ban, uh, but more or less that's, that's what explodes into space. So when you have a real simple piece of hardware that's more or less <coughs> when you're getting something much more complex, well, you fit everything inside in single monolithic monolithic block, that's a bit of a challenge, and you, there's no real granularity that is not in space, and that's a big lack of the FBDF API. The DRM KMS model, it's actually uh, more the KMS model than the DRM, um, is that you still have a mainframe buffer, still a piece of memory. You have optional planes, there's one on this, on this slide, that you can have on the top of them, you can always use that. And they all scan out and well, overlay composite scan elements, a block that they call the CRTC. So for this reason, that's the cathode ray tube controller. Uh, hopefully nowadays there's no cathode ray tubes that we control or whatever, that's still, that's still how they call it. And that block outputs of the pixels in a digital way. Uh, and that's fed to a second block that's an encoder that will actually encode that into signals that you can get out of your SOC or out of the board uh, to a connector, to a panel, to whatever. Um, and then the encoder goes to one equal a connector that can actually also be like a panel that's, uh, that's uh, on your system. The device model in video for Linux was pretty simple to start with. We had to bought for buffers, <coughs> but really frame buffers because the idea was not to pay them then. We had like a few buffers on which you just uh, put uh, video frames and then push that to, to the hardware. We had the display device that was analog as well, and that would output to a connector. We refined that a bit with the introduction of the, of the media control API, uh, in that we actually nowadays expose the whole topology to user space. So we have a graph of blocks that have, uh, that have paths, and we have links between the paths. So that just describes the data flow topology that's exposed to user space, and application can actually control the formats and every path individually. Um, so we have like much smaller granularity of control over there. Uh, um, media for Linux and media control uh, systems can get very complex. Uh, this, for instance, that's not really related to display. That's a camera. Uh, that's a camera interface in the uh, in the uh, Nokia phone. Uh, and you actually have quite a couple of blocks in there that are all exposed to user space. You need a pretty clever user space application like with user space, mid layer, or library, or whatever, to control that. But at least it's, it's feasible. <laughs> Talking about the different use cases now, that's why we have a bit of long introduction. Um, so, 3 API, FBDF, DRAM, Video for Linux. Well, before Giving you my opinion on that, I just want to uh, make a quick comparison between FBDEV and DRM. As I mentioned, I had to write a DRM driver recently. It just happened that I had written the same driver, at least uh, two of the main of the same driver for FBDEV. So we got this part of that supported by two separate drivers, one for FBDEV, one for DRM, and it's supported by all the same set of features. Um, so the FBDEV driver is uh, bit more than 2,000 lines of code. Um, and when I wrote the DRAM driver, because the DRAM API allows you to, be, to do many more things that the DFD uh, API, but well, I expected uh, that the DRAM driver would be more complex and bigger. But it 
it actually turned out that the beam driver is smaller than the FBD driver. There's quite a big difference. So from a uh, driver right to point of view, it took me more time to write a driver because there was no documentation. I had to read the source code all over. Uh, but nowadays, if you had to, uh, to write a new different driver for, especially in uh, embedded display controller, so a piece of hardware that can handle the display, that can do transformation, uh, that uh, can then push the data to different, uh, different devices, different connectors. <coughs> it actually turns out that it's not more difficult to implement a DRM driver, especially if you've not been exposed to either the FBDF or DRM APIs before, you need to learn them from scratch, then it's, in my opinion, easier nowadays to learn how to write a DRM driver and use that. If you want to write a GPU driver, that's a different story. It's really, it's really complex. Uh, but from the 2D and display point of view, my opinion is that uh, DRM is actually easier than, uh, than it be there. So speaking about the use cases, what use cases will we have for FBDEV right now? So what are the reasons to write an FBDEV driver nowadays for a new piece of hardware? Well, that's it. In my opinion, there's no reason to do that. Uh, people did that because DRAM didn't allow you to, uh, to control the mode setting, for instance, uh, in the very beginning. People wrote FBDEV drivers because that's what they knew about. People wrote FBDEV drivers because, well, they thought it might be easier with DRM, it's not scary, with GPU, 3D, or things like that. But nowadays, that's not true, really. <coughs> so from a kernel point of view, uh, I advise all of you to go to the DRAM KMS APIs uh, for display and to just totally completely drop and be there. That's something that we started doing. A couple of embedded vendors, some major ones actually, uh, there's TI, there's uh, Samsung, there's SD. They all wrote display drivers that support the DRAM and KMS API. For uh, historical reasons, those drivers also support the FBDEV API. Um, that's, I'm not sure if it's really valid nowadays. Uh, the idea behind that is that you have like big sets, huge stack, huge space applications, libraries, big server, or whatever, that support FBDEV. So people wanted to make sure that those applications would work uh, correctly with the drivers. But at the end of the day, I recently had to, uh, to hack on an Android system. Uh, Android is based on a VDEV, so it's hard in a couple of places in user space. And I got, uh, I got asked to see if we could switch that to DRAM KMS so that we could get rid of the uh, VDEV driver and kernel space and just rely on the DRAM KMS APIs. And it turned out that it's actually what was a bit complex because Android internals are really a mess. But apart from that, from an API point of view, um, that turned out to be quite easy. I mean, DRAM, the DRAM API is not that complex. Uh, and I tried two approaches because I have two major components in the, in the Android kernel space that's uh, accepted with the, the graphics driver. They have an init process that just want to display a boot logo. Um, it's a really small application that should not depend on many external components. So in that case, I went straight to uh, the DRAM and KMS IO controls uh, with no intermediate layer. And then there's a graphical locator in, uh, in Android that handles uh, location of buffers, page flipping, uh, that kind of operations. And for that, I use uh, the user space libdrm and libkms libraries that uh, are part, well, not of the kernel space project, but still part of the DRM infrastructure. And it was quite easy to use as well. So, depending on the use case, you might want to go directly to the kernel API. You might want to use a use space library that uh, should make your life a bit easier. But in both cases, the amount of code that you need to write uh, is much bigger and can actually be, uh, be a bit smaller for a peer and then uh, than it be there. This another use case that I would like to mention because I'm more or less saying here that the FBDEV API, and I've said that in the past, should be deprecated and hopefully in the long term uh, be removed from the kernel. Looking like 10 years ahead now, that's like an infinity of time in the future. 
future. Uh, DRM KMH should definitely be used, but there's also, in my opinion, a couple of use cases for video phonics. I don't think you should use video phonics to display graphics. If you need to, if you want a frame buffer, uh, needs to paint on that and then push that to the screen, that's not proper. You know, it has never been designed for that. You can use it, uh, but really, that's not, uh, not a really good, uh, really good use case. So, if you nowadays need to interact with a display device, uh, that's really, uh, really a display device that can be hooked to an HDMI monitor, to, uh, to a flat panel, into uh, in an embedded device. You should use DRM and KMS. It's your part special thing, so you can have multiple frame buffers right to the back buffer while the, the front buffer is coming out and flip the buffers. That's something that uh, video fully provides as well. But DRM and KMS will let you do that. So there's no real use case uh, for, for video fully in my opinion from display hardware. But we also have video output hardware, uh, especially used in. Uh, on special systems like uh, Cisco, it's lots of them. You have video conferencing hardware. You need to handle 10, 20 video streams, inputs, outputs, going to all kinds of devices. But that does not display just video. And in that case, the video phonics uh, API is what's suited for that. But to repeat myself, it just not display hardware. It's really time to video. So I'm, I, I won't say that video phonics is dead. It definitely isn't. I'm an active developer and there are many more in this room, so if I call for video links to be deprecated from video output, I'm not going to get out of here alive. Um, but its main use case is a really targeted video. For display, you should use DRM and KMS. So, yeah, you know, DRM and KMS, in my opinion, that's everything else. So, all display hardware, at least from a kernel, a kernel perspective. Nowadays, if you have user space components that you need to be blocked, and if your hardware uh, only has FBDEV drivers, well, if you have time, please write a KMS driver and drop the FBDEV driver. But realistically, in the user space, uh, developers will not have time to do that. So hopefully, slowly, we'll move over the RM KMS and move drivers over. But in the meantime, there's still valid use cases for the FBDEV APIs that you need to, uh, to be able to use whatever hardware your, your platform is stayed on. As a model, I said that you should target DMS, DRM and KMS. I'm going to uh, give you a couple more information on the DRM and KMS API. Um, because a couple of people uh, told me earlier this week that they were actually interested in uh, seeing what's inside. It's a pretty scary, it seems, well, for many people, uh, mostly because it's not well known. So, what's DRM and KMS? Well, from an API point of view, you really have to start with DRM, that was the Direct Rendering Manager, uh, and that was an API that will allow you to uh, manage memory uh, and to more or less manage your direct uh, rendering engine, so that was GPU. Uh, and you had a little set of file controls to uh, manage, like, um, AGP configuration uh, to uh, Put buffers around, put uh, fences, synchronization points, things like that. Really needed for the three D to manage uh, current queue in hardware. So that's a DRM API. It had no idea of display of modes. Uh, what I mentioned earlier with the CRTC encoder and connector model, that's not part of the DRM. Then the KMS API is an addition to that, and the KMS API kernel kind of mode setting adds you both for the display. So that's setting the mode, that's enumerating with uh, what's in there, uh, that's creating uh, frame buffers, uh, flipping pages, things like that. So operation on the display side. And this shows the uh, relative importance of the different uh, DRM KMS API components we have in the kernel. So that's the number of IO controls uh, that's being used. So you can see that there's quite a lot of DRM IO controls, a uh, bit less of KMS IO controls. And then you have lots of IO controls that are actually driver specific. As I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, there's a big part of the API that's driver specific because you have driver specific requirements to, to uh, manage your memory, to, uh, to synchronize the different hardware components. Um, and the way DRAM handles that is that when you want to, to support a new feature, you start with a driver specific IO control. And then when a couple of devices actually uh, implement 
to run for our model is the same feature, then we try to standardize that. So, already talked about the KMS device model. Um, on the left side, that's the memory. In the middle, the CRPC and the encoder, that's usually what you have on your system chip. And on the right side, what they call the connector, which could uh, actually be also a panel on the system, uh, is off chip, either on board or be off board. I'm going to introduce briefly two concepts that are really uh, core to the KMS API. That's the frame buffer first. So, a frame buffer is an object that can store pixels. Uh, and that can be used to then, that you can pass to your CRPC and scan out the pixel to the display. So a frame buffer has a couple of properties. It has a size of a width and a uh, in pixels. It has a format, it can be any kind of RGB format, YUV, or whatever you want in my drivers. Uh, it has a couple of more information, like pictures, subsets, uh, we're not going into details there. And more importantly, it has memory. For many formats, you just need a single, uh, single piece of memory because everything is contiguous. We have, mostly for YUV formats, you can actually have different planes in there, so that means you store your Luma information in one piece of memory and the Chrome information into another one. So a frame buffer references several memory objects that are called in uh, DRAM uh, GAN objects. A GAN object, well, that's now really reference to a given piece of memory. Uh, they can be assembled to create a frame buffer, but you could just need a single one or several of them to create a frame buffer. The game object is a piece of memory uh, that you can pass around inside the uh, inside device. It has a couple of properties as well. Um, and then the way all this is handled is that you get a game object inside a kernel uh, that uh, you can reference from user space for all kind of operation of memory. Uh, and you can also request a kernel to give you a global handle on that that you can pass to another application. That's a file descriptor. And you just push the file descriptor to uh, another application through Unix socket, and going into the details. And the other, the other process can import that to the kernel and then reference the same piece of memory. Um, so that's more or less the, the model in, uh, in DRAM is that you, you manage game objects internally, you assemble them to create a frame buffer, and then you, uh, you just push the frame buffer to CRDC to page flipping. Just a couple of quick words about the future, at least what I expect in the future. I obviously cannot foresee everything. Uh, one really important piece of work that uh, is ongoing currently in the, the display side, the generic panel framework, or uh, we're probably going to rename that to the generic display framework. Basically, it turned out that no support in the kernel, no standard API that would be used by the drivers to handle the display panels. So all of them would, uh, well, in the, in the best case, you would have semi-standard panel drivers that could be used by a single uh, display panel. Uh, so you could reuse the drivers for different boards, but as long as the panels are connected to the same, the same SLC. Um, and in the worst case, you would have like the panel driver embedded inside the board code, so that just doesn't scale. We decided to try to fix that and to create a generic panel object handled by a generic panel driver uh, that uh, would be controlled by your display control driver through DRM, DRM or even FB if you want APIs, uh, and that would then communicate with the hardware on the bottom side. You have lots of different panels, lots of different control buses, I suppose CSDR is quite common, DSI is also a common, uh, common uh, bus in the, uh, the display world for control panels. So that was the first iteration of the proposal. And we then actually realized that that wouldn't be enough. That we needed drivers for panels, but you can also have external chips like uh, encoders, transmitters. You can have a chip that will convert your uh, DSI video data into HDMI. Uh, you also needed standard drivers for that. So that kind of transmitter or bridge chip is definitely not a panel. And I didn't want to call that a panel. So we decided to go for a display framework to a panel framework and have different uh, different drivers uh, that, uh, that would handle all the different pieces into, uh, into the display pipeline. So that's definitely work in progress. I posted the first uh, RFC on the Linux Media, uh, FB Dev, and DRL, D uh, DRA Dev all mailing lists a couple of months ago. We discussed that last week with a couple of people others, and I'm going to post, to post a second version. So that's, stay tuned if you're interested in that. That's going to be hopefully something really interesting. 
uh, that many vendors need actually. Contact information to finish with, three mailing lists, that's the main source of information. There's my email address as well, please feel free to contact me. Um, and I think we're just running out of time, so a couple of questions maybe. Anyone? Can you hear me? Oh, yeah. no. uh, we're currently using Qt on FrameBuffer. Yeah. Do you know if there's Qt on DRM KMS? There's no real Qt on DRM KMS directly. Uh, <laughs> nowadays, unembedded systems, well, there was a talk about Qt on embedded systems yesterday, actually. Uh, so it's either uh, GLES or uh, Wayland, mostly. That's the two, the two real solutions that could be pushed forward. If you don't want to use Wayland, then you will need the GLES implementation, and that one can rely on the RMKMS. So it's still being a timid player, uh, but that's what QD is, as far as I know, is going to do in the future. But writing a value for QD for the RMKMS, that's something that should actually be easy. I, mean, I, can, I can maybe help there. Uh, yeah. There is an experimental pattern that also directly uses KMS. Okay. Uh, nice. I can just add to the talk after that. Thanks. Maybe one last question. Yeah. Uh, what would you expect for the future for 2D graphics? I mean, uh, 2D acceleration? Uh, uh, no, I mean hardware which can't be accelerated. And, right. Um, currently, uh, most Wayland, uh, uh, most people go into the Wayland direction and. They expect uh, 3D rendering, so would you expect something like Wayland or the 2D, like Unity 2D maybe, something like that? Yeah. Well, I'm not sure if I would expect Wayland for 2D, but we definitely need a solution for that kind of hardware. I mean, in the future, we'll, we'll have more and more hardware than we'll have GPU support. Hopefully, more and more will be open source as well, but well, that's another issue. Uh, but we'll still have hardware that can only do uh, 2D, that can only do display. And for them nowadays we use the uh, FB Dev, many people use Direct FB. I wouldn't be surprised if we have live with Direct KMS or even the Direct FB backend for KMS. Uh, that would be something that, that, that could be supported in the future. But it's, yeah, it's a bit difficult to, to know what will happen with a, a Wayland like project with 2D only. I can't really comment on that. I'm not too sure. Yeah, I think we, we doubt it. But we can uh, we can discuss that uh, right after this. Because if there's nothing about Wayland that requires 3D acceleration at all, it is totally right. just plain buffer based. It's the same okay. buffer as you don't want. Thank you.